Hi everybody! It's Ask Dr. Lori live! How are you? It's good to see you all. So we're here tonight to talk with you about all different things, a lot of different things this week. So really happy to have all of you with me. Thanks for being here. And Ask Dr. Lori live tonight is going to take all of your questions. Remember, I'm Dr. Lori, the PhD antiques appraiser. I'm going to talk about art, antiques, collectibles, all the information that you want to know from the real expert, you know, from the person who's been doing this for years and years and years, decades even, uh, to teach you about these particular types of objects. And I want to make you aware of a lot of the specials and a lot of the special things that we are actually doing um, on the channel. So thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. And of course, don't forget to share the channel. But for the most part, I like you guys to have a sense of an opportunity to kind of ask me those questions that you don't always have an opportunity to ask. So thanks for doing that too. So tonight you're going to learn a lot about uh, different types of art, antiques, and collectibles. And I want you to remember a couple of things. Also, I'm going to talk about travel because a lot of you have asked me about travel. And I want to do that too. So when, I'm at, when we're talking tonight, I want to make those connections for you about, in fact, objects that relate to travel. So objects that, in fact, relate to travel, such as um, artworks and great landmarks in the world and places like Rome, Italy, and other places. And I also want you to have a sense of, again, how these particular things work. A lot of you have asked me about art history to, in fact, inform you a little bit about art history. So I'll do a little bit of that, too. But for the most part, I want you to know about values. And when you're out there thrift store shopping or you're going to the flea market or the antique store or such that you can actually learn a little bit about that. Tonight, it's going to be expert answers to your questions. So keep them coming and I'll keep answering them tonight during, of course, Ask Dr. Lori live. So um, I've told many of you in the, in the YouTube story that my birthday's coming up. So I wanted to show you a couple of things that relate to birthdays. And some of them are, in fact, uh, this is like a weekend. I don't know if you're like me, but if you're like me, you celebrate for like the whole month or at least the week before your birthday. You really make birthday a holiday. <laughs> and because I always thought I got gypped because I didn't have a summer birthday, um, in fact, what I would do is I would, even as a little kid, I would kind of extend the Christmas and Hanukkah holidays, <laughs> kind of extend it to my birthday, which is uh, the 11th of January. So anyway, so I wanted to start with this. This particular piece, of course, has to do with birthdays. And this is, of course, a birthday cake, or it's actually called particularly Cake Study Number One. And it's by a very famous artist, a New York, Amer an American artist, a New York realist. And the realist movement reemerged re at the end of the 20th century. It started really at the beginning of the 20th century with American artists like Robert Henry and others. At the end of the 20th century, a lot of artists who were working in New York also revived this idea of realism. So painting in a way that things actually looked realistic. So if you go to our community tab, which is where I want you to get used to the community tab, and I want you to get used to, in fact, the community tab in basically understanding that the community tab is the place you need to go, because that's where we're going to put all of the special things. We're going to put answers to, of course, uh, questions that you might have and information and values about particular works. So the birthday cake painting here by the American artist and teacher, uh, the Pratt Institute professor, Chris Wright, is go information about it is going to be on the community tab. So if you want to learn a little bit more about painting and some of the things that you should look for, what you should look for on the back, how oil on canvas paintings are going to differ from oil on panel paintings, what you look for when you're trying to find those valuable paintings for a song somewhere, flea mart, yard sale, grandma's attic, wherever it might be, estate sale, thrift store, I want you to check out the community tab. So here's how you find the community tab. It's not difficult, but you've got to subscribe first. So make sure you subscribe, ring that bell, see the subscribe button, of course, and then ring that bell. So hit subscribe, and then of course, hit the bell too. That will give you notifications. It'll also show you, again, it'll re relate to you on the community tab. Now remember, if you have, in fact, the community tab, and then you um, have a different device, so maybe you use your iPad, or maybe you use your, your computer, your laptop, or maybe you use a cell phone or a smartphone, it'll be a little bit, little look a little bit different on your device, but look for it. You're gonna look for the subscribe and you're gonna look for the community tab. Don't forget to share and don't forget to ring that bell. Having said that, the community tab is going to give you a lot of free discounts. It's gonna give you some information that you don't typically get anywhere else. So yeah, I want you to watch the videos 
And you could use the binge link to do that. The binge link will give you a lot of places where you can actually watch the videos. But tonight I wanted to talk about some of the stuff that I really love. Some of the things are kind of unusual and quirky, not only about me, but about the history of art too. One of them has to do with um, pieces that relate to, of course, children, having children, babies, and birthdays. So these two pins that I'm wearing actually are birthday pins. And if you look at them, I put them on, I haven't put them on in years, but they were something that came to me at my birthday as a very, very small child. Some people would actually get a cup, you know, a little sterling silver cup when you were born. We weren't of particular wealth, but I think one of my dad's business associates actually gave me these upon my birth. This particular piece is a pin and I'll show it to you. And if you look at the back of this piece, it says Laurieann on it. It's actually in, it's actually, um, I should have asked them to take it. I didn't think of this when I did this, but they actually are a little pin and it says Laurieann engraved. Just nice to have engraved pieces. So it's a little pin because my middle name is Anne for Saint Anne because my mom had me so, so late in life that she, they were praying to Saint Anne as Catholics, who was, of course, the, the patron saint of mothers and mother and childbirth. So if you'll notice it, it's a diaper pin. You can kind of see it. Maybe if I put my white glove up against it, you can kind of see that it's the shape of a diaper pin. So there are two diaper pins that were silvered, actually dipped, of course, in sterling silver. And I don't usually wear them. I wear them around my birthday every once in a while. But I wanted to show you those because these are some of the unusual types of things that relate to a time period. So it was a time when a lot of different things were being made, not only bronzing baby shoes, but also other elements that could be used for a lifetime. Because can you really walk around with your, with your bronze baby shoes, you know, once you grow up? Well, not really. So, you know, these diaper pins became really pretty popular for, of course, newborns um, in the 60s, 70s, and part of the early 80s. So interestingly enough, that's what you're looking at there. So I wanted to show you those. And those are really sentimentally valuable to me. But the sterling silver, and they are marked 925, the sterling silver will, of course, be valuable too. So look for those because you might find some of those vintage ones when you're looking through costume jewelry or at the thrift store looking through fine jewelry too. A um, couple of things. Don't forget to go to the community tab and learn more about some of the special things that I feature when I'm talking at the table. But for Ask Dr. Lori Live, I like to take your questions. I also like to talk about some of the things that I really, really love. And one of the things I really love is new. It's not even old like my pins or old like paintings or old like some of the, the vintage pieces we're talking about, but they're new and they're these. You can get a Dr. Lori Says t-shirt, right? And you can, of course, get one of these if you go to the shopping um, on our Save Now or Specials page. And Dr. Lori says, I'm priceless. And I really think the blue, I think I like the blue t-shirt the best. The pink one's pretty nice. The pink one's here too, but I think I like the blue the best. So maybe as a gift, I might give these away as a gift to others during my birthday, right? <laughs> my birthday week. So that's a lot of fun. Um, anyway, what you're looking at is you're looking at these particular pieces. Now, the stuff on the table I'm going to talk about in another video. So a lot of you are saying, oh, you know, a lot of in another video, you can let me see what's on her table and what she's talking about tonight. I am going to talk about these in another video. Don't forget about the specials page because that's where all of our specials are. And don't forget about the community tab. But I want to talk to you about some of the special things, the things that are special to me. And I wanted to, in fact, talk with you about those ideas. And one thing that's really special to me that I've really missed a lot of this year is being with all of you and also is, of course, travel. So travel is something that I really love because travel will make connections. It'll help you to connect with other people, people who don't have your everyday experience. One of the places that is my favorite, and as you probably know, I'm of Italian descent, but Italy is one of my favorite places. And traveling to Italy, particularly to Rome, for not only the great art and architecture, but some of the beautiful places, I wanted to share some of those with you. Because this time of year, I really kind of miss the warm weather, and Italy is nice and toasty warm, and usually when I'm there anyway. And um, also, I wanted to talk with you about something that I really like, which is the period of the dramatic Baroque or the Italian Baroque, if you will. So I want to show you this because one of the things that I remember about my last trip to Italy, and there were a few trips to Italy, thankfully, um, is in fact the Trevi Fountain. So here's the Trevi Fountain and the Trevi Fountain got cleaned. You know, so the Trevi Fountain got cleaned starting in 2014 and 2014. If you look at 2015, if you look at this picture, this particular picture is of the Trevi Fountain prior to its cleaning. So you're going to see the difference between it. If you just, just hang on a second. I want to tell you a little bit about the Trevi Fountain. Um, and I was there and it was really fun. I was there on a cruise 
And I actually got off the cruise ship. And then you take like an hour bus ride to, of course, Rome, the center of Rome. You, the, the port city or the entry city for, of course, Rome is Chitia Vecchia or the old city, basically. Chitia Vecchia is a, a lovely a lovely place and it is a port city. And basically, um, you'd be surprised to know that actually Michelangelo was involved with some of the um, structures that were built, designed and built in Chitia Vecchia as, of course, ships would come into the port for Rome. And then about an hour in, if you take a bus about an hour in, you'll come to, of course, Rome proper, Vatican City, a uh, city within itself, and that kind of thing. So one of the places that I got to stop was, of course, the Trevi Fountain. The Trevi Fountain was um, erected starting in 1732, and it took 30 years for it to be completed. It was ended in or, or erected, completed in 1762. Um, the architect's name is Nicola Salvi, and Nicola Salvi uh, created the, designed and created the Trevi Fountain with the help of a lot of artisans. So if you look at the Trevi Fountain itself, I want to show you what are some of the forms in the Trevi Fountain. The Trevi Fountain is a very, very famous fountain that brought water from a famous aqueduct, a famous ancient aqueduct, and that aqueduct actually um, was the water that would be utilized. They thought it was the best tasting water in the 1700s. And that was the water that was used throughout much of Rome during that time. Daily water from this partic that particular fountain would be taken to the Vatican. Today, it's not potable. You couldn't drink from the Trevi Fountain today. But back then, it was really sent to be um, water that was tasty as well as healthful or healthy. So if you look at the this image, from the uncleaned portion or the dirty portion, of course, of the Trevi Fountain back from before 2014, you can see some of these great figures. And it's the dramatic Baroque. The dramatic Baroque is characterized for the Italian Baroque as being dramatic, just like the Italians were dramatic, right? So the dramatic Baroque or the Italian Baroque has big figures and they're moving their arms and they're active in their you know, expressions. And you can see that here with the figures in the Trevi Fountain. The Trevi Fountain's 85 feet tall and 160 feet wide. And I'm showing you this image, and it looks like a great image, and it certainly is a nice picture of the Trevi Fountain with, of course, Oceanus is riding on the horse, on, of course, the seahorses and coming into, coming into, of course, the sea. And you've got um, the images or the figures of abundance and health next to them. It's relatively a wonderful piece. It's got these architectural elements like that great, um, vault, that great arch, that Renaissance arch, that rounded arch, and the two Corinthian columns, and the rest of this very, very classical antique building. But what I want to focus on actually is the difference. If you look at this picture and you see how dirty it was from, of course, years and years and years, centuries, of course, of dirt and smog and smoke. And then you see this picture where you can see the difference in the background of how white, white, of course, the Trevi Fountain is after the cleaning. And if you're wondering why I didn't get a closer picture for you, well, the crowds were so close to the Trevi Fountain, you couldn't get close to it. So instead, I wanted to focus on some of those souvenirs. And the souvenir um, sellers were actually right in front of the Trevi Fountain. Now, the Trevi Fountain is known for one thing. Not only it's for the fountain, not only for, of course, those great figures, but also for the fact that if you throw a coin in the Trevi Fountain, it is thought and believed that you will return to Rome. So everybody who comes to Rome, of course, throws a coin into the Trevi Fountain. And I did too. And all those coins are scooped up at the end of the day and they are, of course, given to charity. So it's really a wonderful example of what happens with respect to, of course, the dramatic figures of the fountain and also uh, the way in which the 1700s and the Baroque period is really kind of popular in architecture and in sculpture. So uh, Nicola, Nicola Salvi's work is really one that's really pretty spectacular. Having said that, travel has been something that, you know, a lot of us has mi have missed um, over, the, over this particular time. But we're going back with abundance and travel to Italy is going, is going to be easy and just as beautiful and wonderful and exciting as it always was. So hopefully we'll get an opportunity to do that soon. So Perry has a question for me. I have a stained glass from the 16th century in excellent condition. Any idea on value? I have a lot of ideas on value. Yeah. So first of all, in order to identify that yours is really from the 16th century, which would make it from the 1500s, I have to know a certain bunch of things. First of all, I have to see it. 
you know, identifying these pieces and correctly identifying them and authenticating them is more than just saying, oh, it's from the 16th century, so it has to be worth this. That's what non-experts do. Experts look at the piece. You can send a picture to our web, the website, drlaurieb.com. Look at the piece, and then I want to know something about the provenance, and then I want to do some research about the market, and then we can talk about what yours is valued at. Condition will also be important too. So that's how we'll do that. Um, the other things that we want to make sure that you are um, aware of here is in answering these particular questions, the expert is here. Now, a lot of people are out there and a lot of people are telling you what they may or may not know about these particular pieces. But my expertise reigns from uh, academic degrees, many, many years in major museums, as well as, of course, world travel, not to mention, uh, again, decades and, de and decades of appraising objects. So for museums, for private collectors, for personal um, interests, for personal information, for insurance companies, for all different ones. So if you want to know the truth, if you want to really know the real value, stay here. I'll teach you what to look for. I'll teach you how to identify it. And I want to thank all of you for all of the wishes. I've gotten a lot of birthday wishes already, um, two days prior to the birthday, and I appreciate that too. So don't forget that. Yes, yes, many of you are saying, but Dr. Laura, you look familiar. I know you're from the channel, but where else? Well, from TV, of course. I've been on television for about 20 years. The History Channel, of course, The Tonight Show, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. I've also been on Discovery Channel, Auction Kings, uh, Fox Business Network's Real Bar, uh, Fox Business Network, Strange Inheritance. And of course, right here, I talk about real bargains. Susan wants to know, how can I tell if I have a snuff bottle and if that snuff bottle has any value? Okay, well, a couple of different things. Snuff bottles can have significant value. And whether you're on the West Coast, right, or whether you're on the East Coast, it will depend on, of course, market. If you are in Australia or you are in, in Europe or if you're in Asia, again, will depend on the market. So snuff bottles can be very desirable and quite valuable. Some of the things you look for when you're looking at snuff bottles is you want to look for the glass ones that are actually carved. You can look for um, pieces that are made of a carved um, stone like agate or maybe you might have an ivory stuffed bottle or you might have snuff bottles that are made of all different materials. So look at the materials, look at the intricacy of the carving. And if your piece is reverse painted glass and now you're thinking, oh my gosh, snuff bottles come in all these different materials. Yes, snuff bottles were popular all the way. So if for a very, very long time period, so snuff bottles actually can have pretty high value. Some of them are sterling silver, some of them are cast. You can see them in the Art Nouveau period of the early 1900s. You can see them um, about the 1850s, but they're most popular in the, in the late part of the 1800s or the late 19th century. Yes, they can have value, but it will depend on intricacy of style and decoration. So good question. Thanks so much for that question, Susan. Um, Maxine wants to know, I have a piece of pottery marked PC97 on the bottom. Okay, so a couple of things about marks. So you're all looking for marks. I want you to look at form. You know, I was on a video call today with um, a young woman from Maine who said, you know, Dr. Lori, I've been looking at marks because all these other people on YouTube were saying, look at marks. And you taught me to look at the materials and you taught me to look at the forms. And it's much easier for me to now identify what's actually valuable because I'm starting to look at the important aspects of a work. Marks are important, but they're not the only thing. And remember that when you see a mark, sometimes it's a mold number. Sometimes it is a partial date. Most of the time it's not a date, but sometimes it's a partial date. Sometimes it's an ID number for the designer. It can be many different things. So I'd have to see the mark to be able to ID it for you. But generally what I want you to look for is I want you to look for a beautiful form, a well-executed and quality piece. I'm trying to train you how to identify quality as opposed to relying on these marks because marks and signatures are easy to forge. You don't want to get caught into that whole forgery thing. And the problem is a lot of these people are trying to be experts, don't know the difference. So I'm going to teach you the difference. I'm happy to take your questions. This is Dr. Lori live. Thanks so much for being with me. And other things that I want to remind you about, I want you to, re to remind you to subscribe and go, of course, to the binge link and use the binge link. Amanda wants to know, are you the person doing all the appraisals through your website? Yes, I'm the person. I'm the only appraiser doing the appraisals through the Dr. Lori website. There's no one else who's doing appraisals here. 
So people will say, oh my gosh, how are you doing that? I love my work. I enjoy my work. I'm good at my work. So I do my work. <laughs> I also um, look at all the pieces that are submitted. So if something is submitted, of course, I'm going to look at it and say, yes, no, yes, no, you know, whatever. Yes, I can do it. No, you need to do a video call, whatever it might be. And I have a lot of different options for you. Many of you are aware that I do video calls. We do the priority Ask Dr. Lori service as well. So yeah, Amanda, I'm the one and only Dr. Lori and you're getting me. So imagine what kind of a special, what kind of a deal you're getting to get me directly as opposed to underlings or staff people or people in training. I'm the person who does all the appraisals through drlorev.com. Just like I'm the only person answering your questions tonight. <laughs> Good question though. So I want you to, to remind you of all of that. And I want you to remember that when you're looking at these objects to understand what's going to be quality pieces. Tammy has a question. Hi, Tammy. I want a shirt that reads, Dr. Lori says, are they available on your website? They are available. It's very easy if you just look. Is this even open? Here we go. There you go. I'm so happy that you want a t-shirt. I think it'll look great on you. Get a color. There's lots of different colors. Um, but basically, you can get them, of course, through... Um, through here, it's very simple. Just go to the specials page at drlorev.com. It's really easy. The specials page, it says save now, right at the top of the drlorev.com website and click save now specials. Scroll down and look for, of course, um, the shopping tags and look for um, the many of the things that you can purchase there. And some of the things that you can purchase there, many of you know that you can purchase the loop, of course, which is great for when you're trying to investigate what you're looking at. And of course, the tester, which is for diamond testing. If you find something, you think it's a diamond, you can put the tester right on it and it will tell you. And then things like display things, because you know we want our houses to look great. This particular painting is being held up by, of course, a table easel. And you can see those there too. So table easels and other things for display and decoration of your home are also at the Save Now Specials link at drlorev.com. Chandra has a question. Chandra has a question. I have a tricycle. It's very old. How can I know if it's valuable? Couple things to look for. Um, if you have an old tricycle, first of all, is it easy for the wheels to move, right? Do you have rubber tires? Do you have the original pedals? Okay. Um, do you have any rust on it, on the metal? Is the, is the metal rusted because condition will be important to it? Is there a maker's name on it? Any kind of information about a, a maker, like a radial flyer, sort of like the sleds and the wagons and the tricycles? or maybe it's a Schwinn, or it's made by some particular manufacturer, if there's any information like that. Has it been repainted? Because if it's been repainted, that could impact value. Um, if it's a good job, it could impact value positively. Not so good job repainting it, it could impact value negatively. So those are some of the things you look for when you're looking for a tricycle. Hi, Ann. Ann, how do I tell the difference between Bakelite, Lucite, Celluloid, and plain old plastic? Okay, a couple of things. Um, first of all, on another video, I talk with you about telling the difference between Bakelite and plastic when I'm talking about jewelry, plastic or Bakelite jewelry, and there are ways to do that. I want you to be aware and I want you to be careful of these acid tests. These so-called experts, you know, the wannabes who basically want to be experts, these people are telling you to put acid and to heat up a, a needle and poke it through your piece. You're going to damage your piece doing that, and that's going to devalue it, whether it's plastic or whether it's Bakelite. So you want to be aware that you not don't want to take on any of these stupid tests. So look at that video. That video will tell you specifically how to do that. And the other thing I want you to remember is there are certain properties to these particular materials. So be aware of that. Lucite, of course, very dense. And there are types of plastic with different properties. So once you learn that, you'll be able to identify it. Remember, lucite usually is introduced in the mid-century modern period. So you're going to see some of the forms of lucite relating to what's popular then, more organic forms or curvilinear kinds of forms. Not so many geometric forms in lucite. And you'll also see, of course, lucite is usually clear or see-through rather than Bakelite, which comes in more colors. But it's really pretty simple to identify. Very good question. Thanks so much. Hi, Kurt. Kurt, Avon Sweet Country Harvest Pitcher, is it collectible and what's the value? Sweet Country Harvest Pitcher, yes, it's collectible. Everything's collectible. You'd be surprised at what people collect. Now, is it marketable right now? Are people like searching for it and want it right now? Not so much. So you're not going to have a very high value because markets, like anything else, go up and down. You've watched the stock market. You understand the antique market. Certainly, Certain pieces have a lull and certain pieces go up. Like right now, you're seeing a lot more interest than you did 
maybe five years ago in Art Deco pieces because we're experiencing the 100th year anniversary of Art Deco. I'm going to tell you that as time goes on, you're going to see a revival of some more particular time periods. You're going to see a revival, in fact, of the art modern. You're going to see the art modern, those curvilinear 1940s style chairs, for example. You're going to start to see that coming up within the next five to 10 years. So you want to know what's going to be hot next. Once we have the Olympics back, guess what's going to be very desirable? Well, vintage Olympic stuff. So right now, we're not seeing that because we expected the Olympics to take place right now. And of course, we had the pandemic, so we have a lull in that. Once you see that, you're going to see those pieces spike. But right now, if you get if you see Olympic collectibles using that just as a hypothetical example, you better be buying those. So because once the Olympics comes back, 2021, 2022, you're going to see it spike. What are the things to look for when shopping for cloisonne? Oh, very good question. Okay, Franny has a good question. So when you're looking for cloisonne, I want you to look for a complete piece of cloisonne. What does that mean, Dr. Lori? First of all, when you look, cloisonne should in fact, and I mean real cloisonne, not faux cloisonne. There is a difference. Faux cloisonne doesn't have the actual metal wires going all the way, making the decoration. And then the cloisons or the stones are placed inside and then heated up. So inside that particular wire, right? So you see the wire and then they put the different colors. If you can't feel the wire, you probably have faux cloisonne, kind of looks more like enamelware, okay? So you want to make sure you know the difference between that. Faux cloisonne is not a bad thing to collect, but in fact, it's not as valuable as cloisonne, the real stuff. The other things I want you to look for is complete. So that means you don't want to see where any of the cloisons have been lost. So areas where you just see sort of the hole. So you see if my fingers are the actual wire and then in here, there's no color. It's just the background. The other thing I want you to look for is um, a completed base. So when you turn the piece over, when you turn the piece over like this, if this were cloisonne, you would actually see a completed piece on the bottom. The enamel or the cloisonnes are actually in the, in the bottom. Also, the rim should be completed. So the metal should continue to the rim if it's an open piece. Make sure that you, are, if you are looking at a piece of cloisonne, that if you, it's supposed to have a lid, if it has a rim that accepts a lid, that has an indentation with a lid, that you have the lid. A lot of times what happens is the lid gets broken and then somebody tries to sell it to you as an open bowl or a vase when really it was a vessel with a lid. So if you see an indentation, it's supposed to have a lid. If you're in a thrift store, look around. It's possible that the lid got separated somehow. That happens a lot of times in thrift stores and yard sales and estate sales. So not so much in estate sales. I have to say the estate sale folks are pretty good at trying to put together the stuff that's missing. So think about that. Good question. The Alaska family. When I click on the loop on your page, it takes me to an Amazon to order. Am I shopping in the right place? Yes, you are. You are shopping in the right place. Um, we have a, I have a partnership with, of course, Amazon. They, of course, provide those particular pieces. And of course, as you know, when you do that, you can you can see it right on our page that as an Amazon um, as an Amazon associate, I get credit for that. So you're helping to support the channel when you actually buy one of the loops. You are in the right place. Yes, um, I'm not manufacturing loops. So you understand, but that is the loop that I use and that I advocate. I stand behind. I like that loop. Robert Rivera. Hi, Robert. How does lack of provenance affect value? Like with thrift store finds, very, very good question. Well, what's interesting about that is, yes, lack of provenance can have an impact, but lack of provenance is not the only thing. So when you have an expert like me and you send me a picture of one of those thrift store finds, I can actually tell you a lot about your object. So having a correct and full, complete evaluation is what you really need because a lot of people say, oh, well, that's just the run of the mill, whatever, you know, whatever it might be. Maybe it's a Wedgwood piece. I'm going to be able to tell you whatever is special about that Wedgwood piece where I'm going to, I'm pretty sure a lot of people, other people couldn't. And I say that with a lot of conviction because I've done this for a long time and I've had to correct a lot of other appraisers' mistakes. So yes, provenance and lack thereof will have an impact, but remember making sure that you have the correct identification from an expert will help. And many of you have told me that with my written appraisals, they have helped you to, of course, sell your pieces for top dollar. So I'm happy to help you with that too. Good question, Robert. Hi, Kim, Dr. Lori, don't have a cell phone. Well, that's not a terrible thing, <laughs> right? There's some days that I wish I didn't have a cell phone. I always said, you know, I grew up in an Italian family with all these people and the phone was always ringing that I, I, 
came into went into teaching because I wanted to get away from the phone because teachers are in the classroom. They didn't have phones. Now everybody's got a phone. They can always find you. So anyway, well, I got to ask that question. You got to put that question. I'm sorry. I missed the question. I went off on a tangent. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Kim's question was about that. She doesn't have a cell phone. And maybe we can get it back. I'm sorry, Kim. I'll make sure that I get to that question. That you don't have a cell phone. Is there a way for you to get in touch with me? Well, there's the good old fashioned, you can ring the office phone. I'm sure you can do that. We can get back in touch with you. Or of course, there's always go to the website and hit our contact. Do you need good photos for an appraisal? Yes, I need good photos for an appraisal. Don't get me aggravated now. Do you need good photos? No, send me a blurry, crappy photo and I'm going to be able to work magic. Come on, you know that. <laughs> I do need good photos for an appraisal and I need a good photo because I need to have a clear representation of that object. Now, will I be able to fill in the blanks? Oh, well, you know, the, the label on this is kind of ripped. I might recognize the label. I will probably recognize the mark. I will know the form, but if it's blurry, I mean, you've got to show me the condition and that's why I need a good photo. So thank you for that. Other other questions, and again, I'm so happy to be with you here with Dr. Lori live. I hope you like this. This is a lot of fun. I like to get as many questions in as I can during our time together. Um, so be happy is here. Are painted porcelain pieces from around 1900 collectible? I have one with a beautiful lady on it. There are marks on the back. Thank you. Well, yeah, painted porcelain pieces. So figurines, you know, figurines were very, very popular in the middle part of the 19th, from, from all the way back from the 19th century, all the way until like the end of the 20th century. So then we saw sort of this lull where figurines are not all that collectible. However, when you see the values for some of these figurines, you start to go, gee, I don't know why they're not collectible because they're pretty valuable. But so if you're talking about figurines specifically or just painted porcelain pieces, there's all different types of painted porcelain. So we have seen a change in the market um, from like the Hummel figurines, which used to be a little bit higher in the 50s, 60s, 70s, then took a lull, but we're starting to see them climb again. But then also, and it's not just any old Hummel, for example, but then again, like a lot of the figurines that are of really high quality will also have good collectability and good market value. The Yadros, the Mycin, um, the great works of the Sevs factory, Limoges, those types of pieces. So painted porcelain can have a value. But again, there's a bit, there's a lot of myths out there of people who want to perpetuate this idea that, for example, the younger generation doesn't like antiques. I will talk to people. If I talk to, you know, 10 people on a video chat in an afternoon, you know, six of them are people who are under the age of 40. So, you know, I'm talking to young people. So they love antiques. So these people who say nobody wants antiques, nobody wants this, nobody wants that, it's not really true. And the other thing that all of you do, you're talking to your daughters, but you're not talking to your granddaughters. You're talking to your sons, but you're not talking to your grandsons. So don't forget about the grandchildren who may want your stuff. Oh, my kids don't want anything. Well, your kids may have all of the stuff already, or you might have already handed that stuff down. The grandkids would want it too. And I hear that a lot from the you know millennial generation, if you will. So yeah, lots of things, lots of nice ideas. Don't forget also that there's lots of opportunities for you to learn more about your art, antiques, and collectibles if you subscribe to the channel. And you can do that, of course, by hitting the subscription right there, that subscription button right on the YouTube. And if you're on, of course, Facebook, on YouTube, you can, of course, subscribe and you can follow the channel and you support the channel by subscribing. And of course, the super chats and super stickers also help to maintain and support the channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring that bell. Your subscription will give you notifications and those notifications will help you know when we're doing a special, when we're, know we're giving a discount, when we're know, you know when we're doing a, um, a uh, Ask Dr. Lori Live, like tonight, whatever it might be. So don't forget about that. Don't forget to also use the binge link and subscribe and share the channel with your friends because we always need more friends to help, of course, support the channel and to help learn. Hi, Helen. I know she appraises all items, but I was wondering about the value of the market. Thanks. You know I appraise all items, but you're wondering about the value of the market. I don't know what market you're talking about, Helen. So if you're just, you want to know how valuable something is in the market, well, explain to me what the, that item is. So the market value is one particular thing, and then there's sort of list price. So a lot of you are looking, you're saying, well, this sold for this, and that's listed at that. That's not market value. That has nothing to do with market value. Market value is what the market will bear. What someone has paid, truly paid for an actual object based on an actual sales record where a 
sale was a fair market appraisal or a fair market sale where there was not a forced sale, where someone didn't twist your arm to do that. You know, I don't guess at the values. I basically will tell you what it is based on the market. And an analysis of the market is quite important. So you need to do an analysis of the market. And a lot of people don't know how to do an analysis of the market. So my appraisals come with a market analysis. So you understand where it's going to go. So sometimes I will say, you know, I said this actually today on a video call with a client. You know, I said, they said, well, you know, you're telling me that this piece is worth this today. If I hold on to it for five years, what will happen? And that particular piece is going to experience an anniversary within five years. And I said, well, it's going to spike at this particular time. So I was able to analyze the market and tell them what to do next. And that's helpful for a lot of folks. So thanks for your question, Helen. Elizabeth wants to know, do you appraise Asian embroideries and paintings on silk? Love watching you. Well, I love that you love watching me. Thanks for watching me. And yes, I can appraise Asian embroidery, sometimes the forbidden stitches. And also I can appraise paintings on silk, of which there are many. Some are the ancient pieces. Some are souvenirs from the 1960s when people went to Asia, places like China and Japan. Some pieces are very, very desirable and, and quite wonderful. And I also appraise um, objects like prints on whether it's paper, because the Japanese, of course, um, when I was in Japan, you know, to watch them make paper, the making of paper was so important, is so important to Japanese culture. Um, I also praise things like Japanese woodblock prints. So sure, yeah, I can help you with all of those. Um, a couple of things you want to remember when you're looking at anything that is painted on a um, a support, and that's canvas or silk or paper or, or, or panel board, like this particular work by uh, the great American realist artist, contemporary realist artist, Chris Wright. If you want to learn more about identifying pieces like this, you can go to the community tab. That's where the information is going to be about this particular object and, of course, its value. Julia wants to know, I saw a couple of items on eBay advertising that they were valued by Dr. Lori. Hooray! Yeah, um, a lot of people will link to our website because they want to make sure that their potential buyers realize that they have an accurate appraisal to go along with that actual object as they list it. Many people do that to, of course, um, include in their listings, and it's been successful for them. So I'm happy to see that. Yeah, yeah, I hope it's helpful to, uh, to them and to all of you. I'm trying to help you make more money. A lot of you are telling me, hey, Dr. Lori, you know, last month I made an extra thousands of dollars in watching your YouTube videos and applying what I'm learning. So many of you are either starting your businesses or you have established businesses or a lot of, of course, long time dealers who are saying, I just go to Lori for the, for the expertise. I go to Lori so she can, Dr. Lori, so she can in fact uh, create the, the appraisals for me because I don't have time to do the research. My time is spent in evaluate, getting the inventory and listing my objects on my Etsy shop or my eBay shop and such. So I'm happy to help. Jean, Jean Murano Glass, how to determine real from fake. Well, you know, it's not so much real and fake. It's, is it Murano and was it made in Murano, right? By a Murano artisan. Or is it someone who is in the manner of, in the style of, or making something after Murano, right? So it's kind of like flattery is always, you know, it's, it's a nice form of flattery. Imitation is a wonderful form of flattery. But in fact, you want to get a real Murano piece because real Murano pieces are usually worth more or authentic. Murano pieces are worth more. So in telling that, there are different things. And as you look at more Murano pieces, you're going to be able to identify those that are not as good. It's just like anything else. The same way when you look at one appraiser and you look at me, you start to go, I know who the better appraiser is. You know, the same way when you look at experts and you say, oh, well, that person says they're an expert, but boy, they didn't know this or they couldn't help me with that. And then you look at me and you say, oh, it's different. And I have to highlight the expertise. Do you know why? Because there's lots of people out there who want you to believe that they have the same thing and can do the same thing that I can. And I will tell you honestly, as I do with everything, I tell you honestly, I'm a straight shooter. I am the best. There's a reason why people say I want to talk to her. And the reason why is I'm going to tell you the truth. Sometimes it's going to be good news and sometimes it's not. But I want to have you empowered. I want you to get it. I want you to learn this stuff so you understand how to actually um, identify these pieces and spot quality. So when you're looking at a piece of Murano, what's authentic and what's not, the more pieces of true Murano that you look at or authentic Murano that you look at, you will almost immediately, once you get that in your gut, you're going to go, oh, I know that that's not something that I want. I want you to be able to walk by the junk. I watch a lot of these other channels of people who are supposedly, of course, experts, and they're they're in these stores, and they're walking by the valuable things. Now, two things might be happening. 
they know it's valuable and they don't want to point it out to you because they want to get it for themselves. I don't want to compete with you. I want to help you. Or in fact, they don't know enough to know that the piece that they just walked by is is not a val is a valuable piece. They may not know enough to recognize it and they're focusing on something else. Oh, look at this nice little footed dish and it's amber color or it's green color or whatever it might be. And oh, I'm not sure of the pattern, but I think it's pretty and it's more show and tell. I want you to learn what to look for. So that's why I do these live. Um, of course, Ask Dr. Lori's with you too, because I want to answer your questions. I want you to be able to get the information. You know, knowledge is power and I want you to have the power. And the power I think I should share. So I do. So anyway, it's great to be with all of you. Thanks so much for being here with me. And this is M. M wants to know, is it better for you to do an appraisal by pictures or by video call? It's not better either way. It doesn't matter to me. I can do just as much. If there's something that I need a video call for some reason, I can do it. If there's something that I need and I want to photograph, I can do it. It doesn't, it's six of one, half dozen of another. There are some times when I think it will benefit you. So I suggest to do a video call. Um, but you can send pictures first and I can look at pictures first if that's easier for you. Do whatever's easier for you. But I think uh, there are a lot of people who prefer to have the conversation with me and have me right there on the spot so they can ask a question in a video call. So the video calls are popular too. And so is the, the photo appraisal. You know, I was taught, you know, uh, to get the PhD to look at these things using video or using, of course, photographs. So I have trained eyes to be able to assess these pieces by those particular methods. So that's why it doesn't bother me either way. I think a lot of people can't do that, but I was trained to do that. We were actually given, we were set, uh, you know, to, to get the PhD. One of the things, one of many things I had to do, a lot of hoops you have to jump through. Um, but basically one of the things I had to do was I was sat in a, a, a dark room with a slide projector way back when um, and a computer, but a slide projector. And basically what they would do is they would give me a two by two inch square portion. So about this much of any work of art from the whole history of art, from you know Mesopotamia, from cave paintings all the way up to today. So from Mesopotamia to me, it could be any object from anywhere, from any culture at any time. And they'd show us only that little part and we would have to identify it. So people are saying, well, how does she do this? That's how I do this. I have significant training, academic training, training in major museums, the Yale Art Gallery. I've lectured at the Louvre, the Uffizi, the MFA in Boston other places. I mean, that's how I do it. So when you say, oh, you can't do it from a photograph, maybe other people can't do it from a photograph, but I can do it from a photograph. I was trained to do it that way. Anyway, other questions. Reclaimed by Angel. Um, how important is a recognizable artist in the value of art? Should we still pick up paintings that are well executed or are they still a good investment? Okay. Recognizable artists. So famous artist name, right? So if you've got the opportunity to buy an authentic um, I don't know, Claude Monet, right? I'd say, yeah, buy it if you could, if you could afford it. Um, so sure, a recognizable artist name, it's also known as, as a listed artist. There's actually a list of all the artists of people who actually made their life's work or their career in, in art. Um, that would be important. You may not know this tip, but this is one of the very important tips. Did you know that in the art, in the world of fine art auctions, the most valuable pieces by painters are usually held in regard by painters who were also teachers. So painters who were teachers, actually their sales records tend to be higher than those who did not teach. So you know the old saying, you know, those who teach don't do, right? Those who can do, those who can't teach. Well, guess what? In art, in the art world, those who teach can. <laughs> anyway, so that's one of the things you wanna think about as well. Um, so yeah, if it's a recognizable artist, sure, it's a good idea to do that. You know, if you see a John Singer Sargent sitting by the, the side of the road and somebody wants 20 bucks for it, sure, pick it up. Probably won't happen, but you never know. If you see a work that's well executed, that can also be a valuable work of art. So don't just discount it just because you may not recognize the artist's name. It's not only about, of course, branding, but yes, we do like brand names better. Haunted Doll wants to know, any chance you'd consider offering a limited monthly subscription rate? I have um, bit the worth point bull and I'd rather invest in you. Well, I'm gonna tell you a couple of things about what I what the, what you're asking about is our priority, Ask Dr. Lori service. What that is, is that gets direct access to me, I make you a priority. 
So you can submit as many objects as you like, photographs, and I will look at those photographs and talk with you about them and provide information about them, including uh, values. So, you know, people will say, oh, you know, you want to do this. I don't really think that you just trying to analyze a market and it's the same as sort of looking at free sales records on these other places. You actually get an expert to talk to. And I'm not just any old expert. You know, I am the America's appraiser and I'm the expert of experts at this particular in this particular field have been for a long time. So, yeah. Do I think that it's better to have a one on one so you can really answer your have your questions answered? Yeah, I think that's better than just looking through old sales records or looking through old auction records in a market that you may not be able to evaluate well. So, sure. Um, and what am I going to say? Am I going to say, oh, yes, they're better? I don't think they're better. I think they're different. Um, but I will, you know, I want to give everybody their due. I'm a good person, but I would say, sure. Using the priority Ask Dr. Lori service, I mean, it's, and then I go, don't ask me. Ask people who have used it. There's testimonials all over the website. Go to drlorev.com, hit testimonials and read what people say. Kim, I have two matching handmade chairs with spindled backs. Before 1846, the craftsmanship is not great. Were cane chairs now needlepoint seats? Would they still be valuable? Okay, there's a lot going on here. You have a spindled back, so a Windsor-style chair. The craftsmanship is not great. What does that mean, that the actual wood not great? Were cane, they were once caned chairs, but now they're needlepoint seats. So it was a cane seat, and then somebody put a needlepoint seat with, a, with stuffing, like an upholstered seat, on top of that. Would they still be valuable? Anytime you alter a piece, you alter its value. I'd need to see it to be able to tell you about its value. Send me a picture to the website. I'll be happy to take a look. But once you alter it that much, this is why a lot of the repurposers and a lot of the upcyclers, a lot of the DIYers will get in touch with me and say, hey, Dr. Lurie, I came across this before I put, you know, chalk paint in light blue on it to match my kitchen. You know, I've got this Hoosier cabinet from, you know, the 1930s. Should I repaint it? They ask me before they go ahead and do that. So, yeah. Thanks for the question. It's Dr. Lori live. I'm the expert PhD antiques appraiser, Dr. Lori. I'm here taking your questions tonight. We were talking about the Trevi Fountain before, of course, the dramatic Italian Baroque and how we're missing travel, but we're going to get back to it sooner rather than later. Here's a picture of the Trevi Fountain prior to, of course, it being cleaned and the cleaning, of course, project started a oh, long-term project um, in 2014 and 2015. Uh, I was there before and after. It's uh, one of my favorite places to be, of course, in the Trevi district of Rome, near that ancient aqueduct, of course, where the water comes from. And how about the souvenirs? There's, of course, Michelangelo's David as a souvenir and lots of plates that you can take home and such if you get a chance to, of course, look at visit Italy. And I'm sure you'll get a chance to do that soon. It's a wonderful place to travel. It's one of my favorite favorite destinations. I've been lucky enough to lecture in uh, the world's museums and places like the Sistine Chapel and of course the Vatican museums and the illusionistic ceilings and uh, wonderful examples and also the Galleria where Michelangelo's David is. And you may not know, but my master's degree thesis was actually um, from Wesleyan University in my home state of Connecticut was actually about Renaissance paintings and depictions of Venus. So the Renaissance was my first love in terms of art history. And I love when those of you ask me, Dr. Lori, teach us some art history. I'm happy to do that too. I, I like that we are able to teach art history in the way that relates to, of course, objects like Coca-Cola glasses and duck decoys and vintage purses. So this is a nice one. I like this purse. <laughs> So thanks so much for, for the questions too. I appreciate that. I really appreciate your super chats and your super stickers because you are supporting the channel. You're supporting each other. You're supporting more videos to be made and you're supporting, of course, our production of those videos. So thank you very much for being a super chatter or giving me a super sticker during our live, of course, streams. Brenda wants to know, I heard some painting and well-known major museums are fakes. Is that true? There are museums that will sometimes host objects that are after a particular artist for, of course, educational purposes. There are also paintings that I've been known to say, not, the only the, not only the best paintings are always in museums, sometimes paintings are in museums that are A, not all that valuable, that only have historical value, which is also quite important. And again, museums are utilizing and showing works of art for many different reasons. So you have to look into the mission and see what's what. Museums aren't um, trying to show you fakes. If there is something that is not an authentic work or it's, it's on display for another reason, 
of course, most museums will tell you that. You got to read the labels and you've got to, in fact, look around and take a look at these pieces. But oftentimes there are different reasons why a museum will actually host or display a work. Sometimes it has to do with donors. Sometimes it has to do with what's available and availability. Sometimes it has to do with things like and issues like insurance and how much it would cost. You know, when I worked at one museum, we used to have, um, you know, some museums don't have big budgets. So we used to have, in fact, um, certain uh, responsibilities. So one of the responsibilities because of when in the event of fire would be, in fact, that certain members of the staff would actually be responsible for making sure a certain painting gets out of the building when you get out of the building, if the building is on fire. So people would think, oh my gosh, really? Yeah, I was always a big girl and I've told this story before, but basically, you know, one of the, the, the responsibilities I had as a museum professional and a museum staff member was um, to get one of the very big Dutch Baroque paintings and in its big Dutch Baroque frame, a Rembrandt style painting out of the uh, museum in the event there was a fire. So a lot of us had particular paintings that we had to get to before we got ourselves out. So a lot of that has to do with um, insurance and the cost of keeping the lights on. So if you have a local museum that you go to that you love, um, I hope that you will support it as best you can. And that doesn't have to be monetary support. That could just be showing up and going and, and going to an exhibit or going to the museum and uh, patronizing the museum. I'm a big museum advocate. I have been for my whole career, um, having grew up in museums. I want you really to think about that. It's a good place to learn too, just like here on the channel, teach you the real stuff. Then you'll know it and then you'll be empowered. And that's what I want. Thanks for your questions. Hi, Dawn. Oh my God, this is awesome. I know, isn't this awesome? And on Monday, I'm going to be 26 for like the 15th time. So I hope that you will also enjoy this because I brought my a birthday painting painting here by a major New York artist to remind you that my birthday's coming up and I'm going to answer this question as a gift to you. I found a box marked Capodimonte items, having a hard time identifying them. They all have different marks and a few look like cornucopias, vase styles. Can you help? Yes, I can help. There are a lot of different pieces that are, are considered Capa di Monte. Capa di Monte, of course, that umbrella term for ceramics made in Naples and its environs. There are other people who also copy Capa di Monte, applied ornamental, very dramatic, you know, highly decorative pieces. And yeah, I can help, but I need to see a picture. So send a photo to drlaurieb.com. It's very easy to find on the website. Thanks so much to the super chats and to the, for the super stickers too because they support the channel. It shows me too that you like what we're doing and you like the content and you like the way I'm presenting it and that it's helping you. And that's really why I'm doing it, right? You know that I just could do this and I wanna make sure that you guys are getting the most out of it. I'm happy for those of you who are being successful as well in of course your, whether it's your business or whether it's just for fun or whether it's your release from you know a long day and you say, I'm gonna go thrifting, you know whatever it might be but I want to make sure that it's fun for you and I'm trying to support all of you. So thank you for supporting me with super chats and super stickers. I want to make sure that you know that I'm grateful to all of you. Um, remember that there's a lot of great information, not only here, but on our binge link. So if you haven't seen all the videos, I want you to take some time and check out the binge link. It might be an easy way for you to binge the Dr. Lori videos you haven't seen. The videos, thankfully, are chock full of a lot of information, a lot of fun. You know, I do a lot of joking around too at my events and of course during this. Uh, Susan, I bought an eight by 10 painting signed by the author, signed by the artist. But when I took my loop out, I noticed that it had been colored over in three places. How do I know if the author did it and happy birthday? Thank you for the birthday wishes. A couple of different things. Artists can go back and actually in paint, the term is in painting, when they paint on top of an established piece. Typically in painting or what you see with your loop, right? Typically in painting is a conservation technique. So you usually wouldn't be able to really see it unless you sort of use a black light. You could possibly see it with a loop. It's very possible that the artist did it himself, went back and addressed an area. And I don't really like the way that figure's nose looks. I'm going to fix that. That's possible. But typically if you see something like that, that's usually a restoration piece. And if you have to look at it with a loop, that means the restoration is not too bad. They probably did a pretty good job if you're really scrutinizing it in order to see it. Um, but I can take a look at it and tell you what I think. I'll be happy to give you my opinion on it. Mary, 
Thanks so much for your super chat. I appreciate that. Vintage clothing, what brands or types do you look for? Look for name brands. You know, today I appraised an Oleg Cassini vintage coat. Fantastic piece, very valuable. So look for those brand designer names, right? You want to look for the designer names of old. You want to look for Coco Chanel. You want to look for Oleg Cassini. You want to look for, of course, even the 1980s, even the Ralph Lorenz. Do I have a Ralph Lauren on? I think I have a Ralph Lauren on tonight. So that kind of thing. I want you to think about that. So those great designer brands. Look for um, designer brands or designer distributors like Tiffany and Company. You know, they're a store as well as a designer. So you want to think about those particular pieces. You might want to look for those old time stores that are out of business, right? So places like Bonwit Teller or maybe um, some of the other places, um, G Fox and Company. And some of these you say, I never even heard of those stores. So some of those old time department stores from the 19th you know, early 20th century to about the 1950s might be popular too. Don't forget about things like boxes, like hat boxes are popular, purses, accessories, shoes, costume jewelry, those kinds of things. Scarves are oftentimes um, very desirable. And look for Hermes, look for, um, I'm trying to think of some of the great names that people, you know, of course, don't look for Prada, Dolce & Gabbana, those kinds of things. They're very, very hot. And a lot of them, of course, look back. And they are, of course, the great design tradition. So you might also be able to find pieces that are really upscale and wonderful quality. And look for things that are desirable today. But then remember, certain types of materials have fallen out of favor. So think about that when you're looking at things like fur coats or snake skin shoes and the like. Thanks. Good question. Lori Disney, Lori Disney, yay. Okay, now I'm hearing rumors that Dr. Lori's only 20. <laughs> I'm going with that, Lori. You are my best friend. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Well, you know, every year I go, oh my gosh, I'm getting so much older, but you guys are keeping me nice and young. And a lot, a lot of fun with all of you. So thanks so much. Thank you very much for the super chat and the super stickers. Thanks, Chris. I collect baby rings. Wow, most are 14 karat gold. What era were they popular? Where baby rings were popular from the late 19th century, the late 1800s, all the way up until about the 1970s and 80s. Certain cultures had them more. The Mediterranean culture were very big on having earrings as well as, of course, um, baby rings. Baby rings are a wonderful collectible, and I like it for a couple of reasons. Jewelry holds its value quite well. 14 karat gold, of course, solid gold is something that's quite um, nice, and it, it does hold on to value, right? Of course, the market goes up and down for gold, just like any other precious metal, but you're you're really looking at a, at a nice example. Um, you will see baby rings, like I was talking about my pins earlier. I was talking about my diaper pins, which were made into silver and engraved for me as regular pins um, from a long, long time ago, you know, 26 years ago when I was born. <laughs> so, but yes, your baby rings are a nice collectible idea. I like that very much. I like that very much. Don't forget about our community tab where all the big information is going to be sent. So we'll show you in a minute how to get to the community tab right after this question. What's the best way to unroll and flatten prints that have been stored in a tube? I want them flat to take pictures to send you. Makes a great, great idea. I appreciate that. So here's what I would do. Take out on a flat table where nobody is around. The grandkids can't be around. Kids can't be around. Nobody's going to play baseball near them. I want you to get bricks, good old-fashioned bricks. I want you to wrap the bricks in white um, towels, like uh, terry cloth hand towels, like dish towels, you might call them. White, no decoration on them, no print on them, white and not colors. Um, white towels, four bricks, wrap the bricks, right? You can use the blue tape around the bricks. And you can place those right on, on tie. I'd rather if you didn't use any tape, but if you have to use tape to keep the towel around the brick, you can do that. Um, try not to have the tape touching, of course, the bottom part where the brick is going to hit the print. The four corners of the print, right, on the flat surface, and then let it sit there. It's got to sit there for at least two weeks and don't touch it. Don't go looking. Don't go checking. Leave it alone. Leave it alone for a while. It's like when my mother was baking a cake. She's like, don't go near the oven. Don't look at the cake. Leave it alone. And that's what you got to do. And yeah, it should unroll them. If it doesn't unroll them in two weeks, flip the piece over and then do the same thing in the four corners with the piece going the other way. But if it's been rolled this way, I want you to unroll it so the curved side's like this and then put the four bricks on the four corners. Is that clear? I hope that's clear. Don't forget about this, the, the community tab because... The, the important information and information about values, like the value of this particular painting, is going to be on the community tab. So I want you to get used to using this community tab. 
Subscribe first. You need to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Subscribe first, ring the bell, and then, of course, um, you want to go to the community tab. There's a subscription and how you're going to do it. It's going to be different on whatever device you might have. If you have a smartphone or if you have a um, laptop or an iPad or whatever you might use. So great, great, great questions too. Terrific questions. Thanks so much for the super chat to the super chatters and the super stickers. I appreciate them and they support the channel and they support all of your fellow watchers all the people who subscribe, but all the important and answers are going to be there. Expert answers from me are going to be on the community tab. A lot of a lot of things, a lot of you have been asking me questions like, hey, Dr. Lori, I have hair pens or hair pins from my doll's hair that were made in the 30s. Are they valuable? A doll collector wants to buy them. They're very rare. The doll pin pens from your um, dolls from the 1930s are very rare and can be quite valuable. So remember, a lot of the times um, the offer will be quite low and you'll be surprised at how low. So I want you to remember that you may not want to sell them all at once. You might want to sell them individually. And I can talk to you a little bit more about that too. I suggest you send me a picture. I'll help you to analyze the market. So it's great that, they, that you have a potential buyer. That's a good thing. But you also want to make sure that you are getting top dollar, as close to top dollar as you can for the objects, and I'll help you do that. Lots of questions, lots of wonderful information, so much fun tonight. We're having a lot of fun tonight here on Dr. Lori Live, and I feel like you're all here at my birthday party, so thanks so much for doing that, and don't forget about getting yourself a gift. I always say treat yourself, right? Maybe your gift might be a Dr. Lori Says t-shirt, right? And those are easy to get if you go to the specials page. It says you're priceless. Um, so I hope you'll wear it with pride and enjoy it. I like all the different colors. You can go right there. There it is at drlaurieb.com. And you can, in fact, go there at the specials page. It's right there at the top of the website. When you go to the drlaurieb.com website, it says save now. And also there is going to be the shopping page. And the shopping page will teach you um, a little bit about what pieces you need to make sure you preserve your objects or to, in fact, display them well. This is used on a table easel because this is about 14 by 14. So a table easel, you can put this up as opposed to hanging it on the wall. If you don't want to hang it on the wall, a lot of interior decorators will do that. So these table easels are really a nice find. And there's something that will give you a little bit more options when you're starting to decorate your house with, of course, these vintage objects, a lot of antique and vintage pieces. And are you ready for tomorrow's new video from Dr. Lori? Well, Here's a, here's a real bargain. Here are two of the objects that were found by, of course, viewers like you that were found and I identified them and told those folks they're real bargains. You're going to be real surprised at how valuable they are. So don't miss tomorrow's real bargain. And I'm going to do a live premiere with you. So you can, of course, see the real bargain premiere of that video, which happens Sunday night at 5 p.m. Eastern time right here on the channel. So don't miss it. I hope you'll join me for that too. There are some real bargains. And it's a, it's a wonderful way to see what other people are finding in the thrift, estate, and of course, vintage and antique market and how they're selling them for top dollar with my help. Lots of fun, lots of fun tonight. So keep your questions coming. And I'll keep answering them right here on Dr. Lori Live. It's fun to be with you. We were talking about travel before. We were talking about, of course, a lot of the other aspects right here on the channel. So much to do. And I wonder what your weekend has been like. Have you been busy? Did you have a busy weekend? Or were you just sort of hanging around trying to get used to the new year? Are you, are you saying 2021 yet? I wonder if everybody is saying 2021 yet. Hey, Diane Ditzler, how the heck are you? Is jadeite still collectible? Thinking of getting rid of yours. Well, jadeite is collectible. A lot of people like that beautiful jadeite color. People love that sort of celadon, light green jadeite color. And a lot of people like to collect it. So if you're thinking about getting rid of yours, okay. I hate to hear that anybody wants to get rid of anything. I think you should be collectors, collectors. But again, it's a good time to think about that. Jadeite is oftentimes most popular in the wintertime. Why? Because it relates, of course, to the kitchen collectibles, the collectibles of that type. So jadeite might be a nice idea for you to, in fact, um, maintain, for you to, in fact, decide to uh, 
move away. And the winter months are usually the time when those types of collectibles become of interest. So sure. And I certainly can help you. You know, a lot of people have um, commented on some of the pieces that folks have sent in over the years. And, you know, um, one of the pieces that I remember was, of course, speaking of kitchen collectibles and kids speaking of pieces like China was, of course, a wonderful Benjamin Harrison presidential piece of China that was purchased at a yard sale for a dollar that I identified for that person. And that person sold it online with my online appraisal report and sold it for $1,000. So we've made a lot of people a lot of money and had a lot of fun in the process. I love doing it for you and I love helping you all. So make sure you share the channel. Make sure you tell your friends and family about it. I appreciate those of you who are watching with family members and friends. That's great. Don't forget to subscribe. I need you to share. It's very important so the channel can be maintained and so the channel can continue. I need you to share. And please remember to subscribe so you get all the important information that's going to be put on, of course, the community tab. Don't forget you have to subscribe on YouTube to the channel. So please do that. So come over to YouTube and watch these particular um, videos here. On Tuesdays, of course, Tuesdays, of course, I play our games. I've been playing some games with you at, on, at the night uh, live uh, videos to the live streams at night. We were playing, of course, Dr. Lori's Treasure Hunt, which is always popular. And of course, Dumpster or No Dumpster. You can watch me play those games and host those games, of course, um, every week too. So lots of videos for you. We're giving you a lot of information that I hope you love. I love all of you. More questions. I'm happy to take more questions. Thanks so much for formulating the questions and thanks for the super chats and the super stickers. I'm happy to, of course, take your questions and field them tonight and always. So other questions for me. And we'll remember, I want you to remember a couple of things. I've been teaching you about how to identify these objects. I want you to look for quality. Quality starts with condition, right? And also good high quality materials. Make sure that you're critical. I want to teach you to be a little bit of an art critic. And people say, oh gosh, I don't want to be critical. That person just couldn't do it. And they were just trying. I know. It's fine that someone is trying or in training, but I want you to look for the quality materials, the quality designs, the quality manufacturers, and of course, the quality artists. So look for those. Drew has a question. Drew, thanks for your support. You're supporting not only this, the channel here, but all of these um, all of these other watchers, viewers too. Thanks. My mom has about 50 Yadro pieces, some children, horses, groups of kids running with umbrellas. Who knows? Which could be valuable? They'll be valuable based on a couple of things. They'll be valuable based on size. They'll be valuable based on complexity of the um, actual figurine. They'll be valuable based on how many figures are within one base. They'll be valuable based on the difficulty or intricacy of different aspects on the vase. So lots of big floral bouquets where every single petal has to be sculpted and made, right? And in good condition and not broken is going to impact value positively. So a lot of things have to do with it. If they're just quick and dirty, a couple of little things, very small, not too much and not too delicate, not too intricate, not too complex, not as valuable, but I can take a look at all of them. Best way to do that is uh, a video chat, you can do that quickly. Show me around sort of the curio cabinet. Or of course, you can also do the priority ask Dr. Lori service, which is another good way to do it. People like either of those services. So you can look th uh, at those up on, of course, um, the Dr. Lori specials page where it says save now at the top of the drlorev.com website. But those are some of the sort of criteria to look for. Star Walker, I love Bob Ross. You love Bob Ross. Okay. You, you, you might have seen, you might have seen me, in fact, um, you might have seen me evaluate a Bob Ross painting, an original one, um, on one of the shows that I appeared on, uh, of course, as a cast member, and that's called Doctor and the Diva. You can see me appraise the Bob Ross paintings and other paintings, of course, there, and that's right here on the channel. So use the binge link so you can find that video, and I'll show you what I had to say about Bob Ross and his paintings. Uh, of course, he was very popular, that popular artist on, of course, PBS for years and years and years. Um, I'd like you to understand and be able to identify what an impact he had on American painting, as well as how his work compares with other artists' work. So happy to do that. That's right there from the doctor and the diva. Yep. Yep. That was a fun show. Um, my friend Kimberly Locke from American Idol, of course, 
um, appeared with me on that show. She co-hosted the show. PB, Lori, Dr. Lori, I recently purchased a Wallace Silver Bowl. Great. It has several markings along with the backward lion. Is Wallace Sterling valuable? Yes. Wallace Sterling is certainly valuable. The Wallace Sterling Company, of course, Providence, Rhode Island, wonderful example. Or Gorham, Providence, Rhode Island. Um, wonderful examples. And Sterling is the mark that you're looking for. Uh, the 925, the word Sterling. Uh, it depends on how big the bowl is, how intricate the bowl is. But if you found a bowl at a thrift store for a couple bucks, you found some money. Really nice. The other thing about sterling is there's a smell to sterling. And people say there's a smell. Yeah. You know, experts like me are able to actually smell sterling without us even turning it over. And people go, gosh, Dr. Lurie, how do you do that? It's years and years of experience and wanting to learn it. If you want to learn it, you will learn it. If you want to mess around, you know, like, oh, I don't know what this is. And oh, that's a pretty color. Okay, mess around. If you want to learn it and you want to make the money, I can show you how to do it. And I've been doing that and I want to continue to do it. So thank you for supporting the channel. You can support it by watching. You could support it by sharing. You, you could support it with, of course, super chats or super ch stickers. Margaret, are Charles and Diana memorabilia valuable? You know, this is interesting. Charles and Diana memorabilia is valuable. It took a little bit of a dip in 2011. Why? What happened in 2011? Well, Prince William married Kate Middleton. That's what happened in 2011. So the Prince, so Charles and Diana were, you know, were in fact divorced by that point and were no longer seen as sort of the heir apparent kind of thing. So you're seeing again this idea that in fact Charles and Diana pieces are desirable. In 2022, you're going to see, unfortunately, the 25th anniversary of the death of Princess Diana. So you're going to see a lot of her memorabilia spike in 2022. Around August, she was she was killed in August 31st of, of 1997. So 25 years is going to be 2022 August. And I want you, if you have a lot of uh, Charles and Diana stuff, to wait a little bit before you list it and list it in 2022 to spike for top value. That's the kind of information the expert gives you. Not this, oh yeah, it might be, oh no, I'm not sure. That's the kind of information you need, the real information that will help you. So those of you who are lying in bed watching me, for those of you who are watching me with the kids, for those of you who are watching me with the dogs and the cats, for those of you who are watching me, you know, for fun in, while your business in, in the background, while you're doing some work at your business or writing out your bills or whatever you might be, I want you to know these kinds of things. For those of you who are taking notes, I am psyched at the people who are taking notes. I love that old school because when you write something down, it connects. There's a connection between from the brain to the hand, writing it down. I love it when you write notes. Do that. It will help you. You can refer back. And if you, if you say, oh, I don't understand my notes, go watch the video again. They're right there, the binge link. We made it easy for you. There's playlists and binge links. It's easy. Beatrice, thank you for your support. You have a Van Gogh print from the Cincinnati Museum of Art dated 1950. Yeah. So basically what happened was you adore them, so you had it professionally framed. Are those prints collectible and valuable? What museums were doing and what they still do today is, you know, if they have a great museum uh, exhibition or if they have a great collection or a piece that they want to highlight, they actually make a print of it because they have reproduction rights. They print it and then they sell the print. And that was very popular in the 1950s with the great impressionist works of art. And people would actually, in fact, make those particular prints. They'd buy the prints to support the museum, kind of like what you're doing with the super chats and the super stickers, right? You're supporting the, the, the thing that's helping support you. And then you could take it home. So some of those posters have moved up in value some. So yeah, professionally framing those, if you love it, it looks great, yes. I have to confess that for many, many years, I, in one of the places where I taught, I taught at the State University of New York, and I had a little tiny itsy bitsy, um, itsy bitsy office because I was low teacher on the totem pole, right? I, I was finishing up my PhD and I didn't have a window, so I wanted a window. So I went to, in fact, the Metropolitan Museum and the Tiffany glass windows. And I had a Tiffany, a poster of the Tiffany glass windows framed and I put it up and I had a Tiffany window in my little tiny windowless office at SUNY Cortland. It was fun. Anyway, but uh, yeah, so I would definitely do that. I've done that myself. I think it'll increase in value a little bit, but you know, of course it's not going to be ever worth what the real Van Gogh is worth. <laughs> it's nice that you support the museum. And of course, somebody supported the museum in the fifties and buying that print. Great. Reclaimed by Angel, when people take you shopping, what is it like um, how often do you find valuable items? 
Ah, oh, hell, come on, you're killing me. How often do I find out valuable items? I can find valuable items every single time. You will pass by what I would never pass by. You will think, oh, I can't be that. And I'll also teach you while we're shopping, I'll teach you what you should never buy. I'll teach you what you should always buy. I'll teach you how to market these pieces. I've made a lot of people a lot of money. And that's why they support the channel. So thank you. That's a good question. People really like this because they get the one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm so happy to do this live with you. And I appreciate all of your efforts as well to stay with me and also to talk about art, antiques, and collectibles, my favorite things. Do you know furniture brand maker Henry Don? Yes. Um, I found an Art Deco style coffee table with the stamp Henry Don. Henry Don's a very, very high quality uh, manufacturer. I've been listening to you tell us about the market uh, for Art Deco. Well, that's great. Um, Henry Don pieces can be desirable. So a vintage Henry Don piece can be upwards, you know, like a dining room set can have been, you know, today and today's market, they could sell into the tens of thousands of dollars. Okay. So that's how, how desirable Henry Don is. Um, also, others like Pennsylvania House and the old Ethan Allen. Um, also, of course, um, uh, Henkel. Um, let's see, Henkel pieces. Uh, what other ones are the big names that you might recognize? But yeah, Henry Don is good. You're looking for quality is what you're looking for. You know, you're looking for, in fact, not medium density fiber board, you know, MDF glued together sawdust. You're looking for, in fact, those pieces that are solid wood. People will say, oh, no one wants brown furniture. Well, not. You want brown furniture the minute that you have a piece of medium density fiberboard as your kitchen table. So let me tell you, you'll take that rock maple table in a minute once you see what the crap is like. So yeah, you're going to see exactly what that is. And a lot of people are going to say that and perpetuate that silly myth about brown furniture because they don't want to move it because it's heavy and it's more difficult to move. So a lot of people say, oh, no, nobody wants that anymore because they don't want to move it, you know, physically move it because it's heavy. But it's wonderful quality. So you want to think about that. Yep. So the style is very important. Now you're getting into, of course, the revival of the Art Deco. So if you're thinking of reselling the Art Deco, now is your time. You've got a couple of years to start reselling that Art Deco stuff that you should have been buying when everybody else was buying mid-century modern. You should have been buying the Art Deco, like I've told you. If you look at my syndicated columns, my newspaper columns, and also the website, I was saying that 10 years ago. So I'll, I'll keep you informed. Rebecca, thank you so much for your generous um, super chat. Dr. Lori, happy early birthday. Thank you. You purchased a 13-inch tall ceramic liquor bottle. Okay, no stopper or lid. Okay, yellow with copper painted vase. Original international liquor in Chicago. Is there a value? About this big, right, with no stopper. So uh, the ones that have the stoppers are usually in that $100 range, maybe $125, um, depending on the figure. I'd have to see the figure for it. So yours without a stopper is not going to be as valuable. But a nice piece anyway, and if it's something that you like without the stopper, it doesn't matter if it's a liquor bottle or what. But the best ones, of course, have the stopper and are unopened. I know, liquor is more fun, I guess, if you are if you open the liquor bottle. Liquor bottles are more fun, but yeah. Uh, Heath, thank you very much for the super chat. Do you put a price on a watch when you can't find anything to compare it to? Um, Unicorn by Rolex in 1920s. I don't think you're a good enough researcher if you can't find anything to compare it to. You can find it comparable. It takes work. It's not magic. You know, so yeah, I think you can find it comparable. The other thing that you can find, in fact, is you can find a relatable comparable. So you're thinking, oh, it has to be exactly the same comparable, but in fact, you can find a lot of things that are relatable to it. But most of the time you can find, for something like a Rolex, you can find a comp. I think people don't always, I think people think, okay, research is just one thing. I put it into Google. I, I, I searched a couple websites. I looked at Pinterest. I looked at, you know, one of these listing things or one of these old auction lex, you know, listings. Um, but there's a lot of ways to find out what, in fact, the true market is for pieces. So research isn't only just one thing. I oftentimes tell people too, you may have to actually investigate other places other than the internet. So. But yes, I can help you. Um, in terms of establishing an appraised value, you have to be able to analyze the entire market. So you have to know when a, when a particular um, sales record is erroneous. Some of them can be wrong. So you have to be able to look at that and say, wait a minute, that doesn't fit in with everything else I'm seeing in the market. 
So you have to really do some market research. Thanks for that question. That's a great question. I hope you're enjoying the questions. I hope you're learning from the questions. Everybody else's questions are interesting too. And I'm happy to hear all of yours as well. So a lot of fun tonight. We're having fun tonight. Um, a couple of other things. If you're wondering what um, I'm asking for for my birthday, I'm always asking for jewelry. <laughs> and if you're wondering what I'm asking, of course, my family and friends to make me, I'm thinking about Toll House cookies <laughs> for my, instead of a birthday cake, maybe a cookie or two. Um, but I'm trying, trying, trying hard. I'm not doing very well in the last month or so. I'm trying, trying, trying hard to maintain that, that uh, and maintain and continue the weight loss that I had uh, throughout the last couple of months. So I'm very proud to have lost some, but I have to cool it on Toll House Cookies. Happy birthday. Thank you, William. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to it. I like my birthday. It's fun to have a winter birthday as a swimmer, as a little kid. So I always thought, gee, a pool party would be fun. But thank you, Jeanette. All the birthday wishes, aren't you, sweethearts? Um, so I always wanted a, a poolside birthday because I love swimming so much. Um, but, you know, the winter is kind of fun, too. I like snow. So maybe it'll snow on my birthday. That would be fun. <laughs> anyway, a lot of fun tonight, and I've enjoyed being with all of you. Thank you so much for your support of the channel. Please remember to share. Don't forget the binge link. When you have a chance to travel to places like Italy, throw a coin in the Trevi Fountain for me. Don't forget the binge link. Subscribe, subscribe. And of course, um, always remember that I'm thinking of you. Thanks for being with me tonight. I appreciate the super chats and the super stickers. All of you support the channel and you support me right here. So thank you very much. I'm Dr. Lori, the expert PhD antiques appraiser. See you next time. <laughs>